So uh, I thought that before um, we look at David Livingston and Central Africa, that uh, I mm -hmm. should read to you um, about a gentleman called Samuel Crowther. And I'm almost certain I can put my salary mm -hmm. here and mm -hmm. bet that none of you know him. And I hope my salary goes back into my pocket. Okay. Uh, and that's the reason why I want to read about him. It's because a lot of our church history about Africa is about missionaries coming and doing things. This is different. Uh, this is an indigenous missionary. And I'm hoping that as I factor it in before we get to David Livingstone, that we will see one of our greatest responsibilities. One of the greatest responsibilities is to find these treasures and get to know them. Um, we're still in West Africa, and that's where we find this gentleman by the name of Samuel Crowther. For those of you who've just come, I've said that before we look at Livingstone in Central Africa, I thought it would be good for us to see something different. And this is an African missionary laboring in Africa, and this was largely in West Africa. Uh, he went abroad a few times, as we shall go on to see, but was always with a view that the church in Africa might grow. Uh, the thrust into, I'm just reading most of uh, a chapter here. Um, uh, yeah. It won't be the whole of it. It will be up to the time that he dies. So it's about one, two, three, four pages. The thrust into unevangelized areas of West Africa during the period 1840 to 1878, so again, remember, the 19th century, could be characterized by the life of one outstanding African. His name is Samuel Ajay. Crowther, we, we need to know him, and we need to know others like him who are part of church history in Africa. Because of his great work and many contributions to the development of the church, we must take special note of the Reverend Crowther as one more of the great men of African church history. Samuel Ajay Crowther was a member of the Yoruba tribe of Nigeria. He had been captured and sold into slavery during one of the many slave raids of eastern Nigeria. As a lad, Crowther was rescued by a British boat from a slave ship and was taken to Sierra Leone, and that's where he was educated. Remember, it was the period where now this slave trading was illegal, and yet it was still happening. We mentioned that yesterday, that it's one thing to stop something legally, it is something to arrest it in actual practice. Like other liberated slaves, Samuel Crowther was greatly helped by CMS. You remember again, Church Missionary Society. He attended their uh, primary schools and received training as a teacher catechist. Because of faithful service, in 1841, Samuel Crowther was asked by the CMS to help the Niger expedition. So that's now going from Sierra Leone, going over to the area of Nigeria. This was a plan to sail up the Niger River from the mouth in the Gulf of Guinea and then to find a way to stop slave raids that were continuing in the interior of Nigeria. Samuel Crowther and the missionary took part in the expedition to see how the land could be opened up to the gospel. So their interest was not just to stop the slave trade, but to take the gospel there. 
Unfortunately, most of the explorers who came out from England to take part in the expedition became ill with malaria. We've talked about that as well. And so before the boat had moved very far up the Niger, the men had to return to Sierra Leone. Although the expedition was a failure for ending slave raiding, it did serve the purpose of showing Samuel Crowther the great need of his homeland for the gospel. Crowther wrote about his experiences on that journey in a book which is called his journal. Now, the, as we are reading this, I hope you are picking out a few lessons. Already, listen, he was writing. And he was writing about his experiences as he was proceeding to serve. And it's something I really need to appeal to you, brethren. Uh, I've done it for most of my life, by the way, with respect to my own life. Somebody right now is trying to write my biography. And all I did was to take that journal and give it to him. He still has it. That way, you're not trying to remember things because you were writing them as they were happening. And I want to assure you, at the time I began writing, it was before I even became a pastor. I was already writing. So I, I wasn't thinking somebody will write my biography. I wasn't thinking like that. I was just writing. And whenever I had something that was a card or an article, I would just throw those things into a box so that this guy just took that box and was going through. And it, it enables you to have real information about a life that then challenges other people who are coming. So it's not about you and your glory. You are a sinner saved by grace. It's meant to encourage others. That's how we are able to be encouraged by this man, because he wrote. Let me continue. In 1842, the CMS sent Samuel Crowther to England for theological education, so he went abroad. In 1843, he was ordained as a pastor in the Anglican Church by the Bishop of London. On his return to Sierra Leone at the end of 1843, he received a great welcome and conducted in English his first service. But his mother tongue was not forgotten, and he soon took a service in Yoruba, probably the first to be taken in that language. However, he was not long to preach in Yoruba in Sierra Leone before the year 1844, was out, he had sailed for Yoruba land. The time seemed right for the CMS to expand from Sierra Leone into other parts of West Africa. Reverend Samuel Crowther, okay, now an ordained minister, seemed to be the right man to develop this work. In December 1844, Crowther, Townsend, and Golma, with their wives, and four African teachers left Freetown on their momentous mission, the first effective outreach from the base of Sierra Leone, so long and patiently developed, to, field, to fields a thousand miles inland. So he's now an African going as a missionary further into Africa. And this is what I'm saying. We need to add to African church history. Let me go on. Looked at on a map of Africa today, the penetration appears slight. In other words, a thousand miles into Africa is next to nothing, knowing how huge Africa is. But at that period, in relation to a slavery infected coast and to the intermittent ferment, ferment of internal wars, it was indeed 
a heroic adventure. So because of the slave trading that was still happening and the intertribal wars, this was a huge undertaking. Uh, the party arrived in the geographical area that we call Nigeria today in January 1845. So it was basically the next month. Not long after that, Crowther met his mother and family from whom he had been taken away many years before. At first, the CMS worked at Badagri and then moved their headquarters to Lagos. From there, the pioneers went inland to Abeokuta in Yorubaland. The first Christian baptisms in Abeokuta took place in, on Sunday, February the 6th, 1848, before a congregation of some 250 people. Two men and three women, of whom Samuel Crowther's aged mother was one, were received into the fellowship of the Christian church. So that's inland, you know where Lagos is, um, and it's not too far inland, but here is a first baptism happening. In August 1851, so this is now six years later, the Reverend Samuel Crowther was called to England for consultation, so he goes back now to England. Since Reverend Samuel Crowther was an African and had visited much of Yoruba land, the British government wanted to get his advice concerning slave raiding. Reverend Samuel Crowther reported that slavery was still carried on in the area, but African church leaders and missionaries were relatively free to move around the towns. Because of the work of Reverend Samuel Crowther and the others in his group, the church continued to grow. In 1854, the Bishop of Sierra Leone visited Yoruba land to see the work. Notice he's from Sierra Leone now, who's coming to visit. At that time, he ordained the first two Africans in that area. In 1856, the CMS sent Reverend Samuel Crowther up the Niger to see if it were possible to take the gospel to that area. In his report, Reverend Samuel Crowther wrote, and I quote, the reception we met with all along from the kings and chiefs of the countries was beyond expectation. Notice he wrote, I believe the time has fully come when Christianity must be introduced in, on the banks of the Niger. The people are willing to receive any who may be sent among them. After the CMS read this report, they assigned the Reverend Samuel Crowther and Reverend J.C. Taylor, in brackets, an African pastor from the Igbo tribe to establish a Niger mission to take the gospel to that area. These are African missionaries that are now being sent to do work in Africa. In July 1857, Reverend Samuel Crowther and Reverend J.C. Taylor joined a British expedi expedition going up the Niger River by steamship. Remember yesterday I spoke about why these, the mouths of these rivers into the ocean is where a lot of activities are happening because they were able to then to travel up using uh, boats to go further inland. Partway up the river, they found a good location for a mission station. So Reverend J.C. Taylor was left at that place to begin the work. Reverend Samuel Crowther continued with the expedition, marking places on the map which would be good locations for future mission stations. Who was talking about being intentional yesterday? I think it was you. This is what we're seeing here. 
being intentional, traveling up the river and saying, yes, I think this would be a good place for mission station. I think this would be a good place for mission station, and so on. On the return trip, Reverend Samuel Crowther went overland to visit Ilorim to see if there are opportunities there for opening a station and Christian work. Since he was well educated in the Bible and also knew the teachings of the Quran, he could speak intelligently with the tribal leaders whom he met. Because of his great work, many opportunities were made available for the gospel message to be proclaimed. However, Reverend Samuel Crowther needed missionaries and church leaders to staff proposed mission stations in order to bring the gospel to inland Nigeria. This is a quotation here, and I'll just read it. The promise of the Niger mission remained. How to secure its realization was the problem. Okay, so it was promising as he looked, but how to achieve it was the problem. It was to Samuel Crowther, who was already meriting the title of the Apostle of the Niger. That's the, the reputation he was now gaining. That the society, the CMS, eventually turned. After much thought as to the best way of evangelizing the Niger area, a CMS missionary, Henry Venn, made a bold proposal, and this was the proposal, that the Reverend Samuel should be made a bishop in the Anglican Church and then assign the leadership of an all-African mission to set up mission stations and evangelize the area. Now, that was a bold step being made in England, that an African should be made a bishop of the Church of England and given the task to now establish missions there. Church leaders agreed to this so that Crowther was consecrated a bishop of the Church of England in Canterbury Cathedral on June 29, 1864. The University of Oxford had previously entered his name on its role of divinity graduates by conferring upon him an honorary doctorate. I love biographies like this. Let's quickly go on. We are almost finished. He's about to die, so patience. <laughs> Bishop Crowther returned at once to Nigeria and made Lagos his headquarters for expanding the Niger mission. He got catechists and schoolmasters from Sierra Leone to staff his new mission stations. He then expanded the work to the towns of Brass and Boni. In 1864, he went to Boni by invitation of the king. The king of Boni, who had become a Christian while in England, asked Bishop Crowther, to establish a mission station in the city. A site was provided and money collected. The European traders gave their support, and despite dissident chiefs and pagan priests, the work was set going. In 1871, Crowther's son, who had been ordained and later became archdeacon, which only Anglicans can understand, took charge at Boni. There was persecution, and in 1875, the first Christian was martyred, was killed. The leading persecutor among the chiefs, Captain Hart, as he was known, in 1877 granted religious liberty, and at his death, the following year, ordered the family idols to be destroyed. So the very person who was leading the persecution ended up being converted and thus 
destroyed the idols. In 1867, a mission was begun at Brass, where in 1875, a leading chief became a convert. And two years later, the king of Brass himself denounced idolatry. And so, by 1878, Bishop Crowther's Niger mission had opened up a former slave raiding and trading center to the gospel. The Niger mission is important in African church history. Listen to this. As the first organized mission of West Africans taking the good news of Jesus Christ to fellow Africans. And yet, we still don't know Bishop Crowther. We don't know him. Bishop Crowther continued his dynamic leadership of the Niger mission in Nigeria until his death in 1891. There is little doubt that he was one of the greatest African church leaders of the 19th century. Because of Bishop Samuel Crowther's great burden for his countrymen's salvation and his dedicated service, Nigeria had been opened up to the gospel. When we come to discussion, I hope we'll respond to this because for me, it is crucial that we don't lose these biographies they challenge us as we go forward. Previously, this has been, been the time to take uh, a break, probably the long break, but we all muddled up, so allow me to continue. You've just come back from your break. I'm sure your legs would appreciate a bit of a rest while your backsides take over that work. So we go into uh, Central Africa, and we are back to foreign missionaries. OK? It's not wrong. As I said, it's justified. Uh, one of the reasons why church history is actually the history of preachers is because, again, it's preachers that are doing quite a lot of the work. They're the ones who are standing in front. They're the ones getting the publicity, and therefore, um, it, it's, we shouldn't throw stones at uh, those who record it in this way. David Livingstone married Robert Moffat's daughter, and um, he arrived in, in uh, South Africa. At that time, there were so many missionaries and missionary societies that were laboring south of the Limpopo that he decided he was going to go north uh, to uh, take the gospel further up. At that stage, Africa, in fact, I think, let me go to this next slide. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, at that time, that middle section of, uh, of Africa here, this section here, was, was basically a blank space on the world map. Nobody knew anything. Uh, there were people there, of course, but nobody knew anything. So uh, David Livingstone decided he, he wanted to leave this southern section here and start making uh, his way further north. And as he was making his way further north, he was jotting down uh, geographical um, landmarks as part of his journals. And with that, sending them back to England, where they were then being plotted onto the world map. And that's how the central part of uh, Africa uh, came to be, to be known. Um, the, the major point that uh, I'd like to uh, bring out of this 
was that as he was making his way into uh, the central part of Africa, uh, the, the, um, the slave trade was still taking place. Remember, it had been outlawed already. But he felt completely helpless because as I said to you earlier on, um, under another, when we're dealing with the slave trade, making missions impossible, he would, he would arrive at a place and just because of his skin color would already be a threat to the people. And yet he is bringing the gospel. And um, he would take a long time to win the hearts of the people. So he had studied medicine as well. So the fact that he was able to medicate people who were unwell in due season won the hearts of the people to him, especially on those occasions where the illness was in the home of a chief. And then he used whatever medicines he could, and either the chief or the chief's wife or the chief's child would then get healed. That then won him the hearts of the people. And then, as he again passed through that village in order to follow up his work, he would find that the, the village was completely deserted, completely, nobody. Partly because it had been raided by slave traders and partly because those who remained behind ran off into the hills, into the jungle, to hide from slave traders. And so he was taking note of this and, and basically sending this information back uh, to England, saying, look, yes, you, you made the, the, the laws, but until you yourselves come and live here and develop this place and get involved in commerce here, missions work will still be utterly impossible. So uh, you, you end up with David Livingstone being called the, the explorer, okay, Livingstone the explorer. But really, it was not exploration that was his primary desire. He was exploring because he wanted to open up the center of Africa for missionaries to be able to come in. And he was also opening it up because he realized that unless actual traders with some moral fiber came in and started trading with Africans and African chiefs, slave trading won't end. And he also saw that if, if development could come into the area, roads, railway lines, and the other amenities that came with uh, development, uh, it would be difficult for missionaries to be able to stay there because they, they were going to need these kinds of uh, facilities. We all know a few things about Livingstone. One was um, that he discovered the Victoria Falls, its actual African name, is um, uh, Mosi Otunya, the, the, the smoke that thunders because of the billowing, um, I was going to say steam, but that's not, dew that rises from, from the waters there. Um, the other is that um, on one of those expeditions, um, there was a, a lion that he, his, his team met, he shot it, but before it could die, it jumped onto him and uh, beat his arm, tried to tear it off, but in the midst of that fight, the lion was losing blood and it finally collapsed and died. Um, the reason why I mention it was because later on, when his body was taken to England, it was 
primary, it was so disintegrated, decayed, that it was primarily that bone that confirmed that this was the body of David Livingstone because it had been broken and then put together but not quite in the exact position. Um, David Livingstone went back to, to England once or twice um, in order to go and um, convince fellow Christians, mission, mission societies, to come into Central Africa. In fact, it was one of those occasions he was speaking at a university trying to challenge the young people to consider missions and consider missions into Central Africa that um, somebody asked him the famous question about um, what he has sacrificed, that here he was someone who could have uh, done medicine in, um, in the UK, the United Kingdom, but was spending his life into Central Africa. And he, he, he gave the historic answer, his arm was in a, in a sling because of the, uh, that same attack of the lion. And then he said, sacrifice, <coughs> sacrifice, such a word should never be used by a Christian in the light of the sacrifice that was made by God's own son for our salvation. And if there is any statement worth recording uh, by any missionary, that's one of them. Uh, we still have a few by mm -hmm. William Carey as well and um, a few others, but that is, I think a pastor should put it there and young people should, should be challenged about giving their lives to God's work because we must never run away from sacrifice for the gospel. Well, the other um, way in which he managed to convince the British government to support his ministry was that uh, he, he said to them that they could find their way into Central Africa through the Zambezi River. And so they, they paid him to actually travel using the Zambezi River in order to find his way into Central Africa. He, he lost a lot of his years um, trying to, to do that, uh, but he actually traveled from the walked, but okay, part of the journey he would be carried uh, by, by the African uh, helpers from East Africa all the way to West Africa, the West African coast, and back from the West African coast all the way back to uh, East Africa. Again, we owe his travels the geographical knowledge that then enabled missionary societies to come into the central part of Africa. Um, another thing that was part of his real challenge which was part of the challenge of pioneer missionary work is that many times he would actually preach the gospel through an interpreter, of course. He would preach the gospel in a village and he would preach his heart out. And then at the end of preaching, the men in the village would then settle down to start drinking their local beer. And it was like, he hadn't done anything whatsoever. And he, he recorded a statement there saying something to the effect that we are the laborers of the night, he said. And he says, um, uh, we've preached many messages with hardly any fruit. And then he said, but we are laying a foundation which we hope future missionaries who are going to come to labor here and will receive, will have fruit from basically one same one, will have individuals coming to repentance and faith. He said, may they remember us, the laborers of the night. 
may they remember us because those early missionaries were basically laying uh, a foundation. The last bit that I would mention is um, f towards the end of his life, well, maybe not even towards the end of his life, uh, somewhere in one of his trips to England, most likely the very first one, he left his wife there together with the children because of the fact that it proved impossible for him to do his work as a traveler. If it was just one place he was laboring, maybe it was going to be possible. But as an explorer with a wife and children, it just proved impossible. So that's how he left them behind and came back into Africa to labor. Later on, um, his wife joined him and she died in what is now called Malawi uh, at that time um, because of the lake it was referred to as Nyasaland. So he, she died there and then he continued the journey into uh, what is now Zambia, continuing to look for the, the, the source of the Nile. Okay? I won't say where the source is now. I almost got my fingers burnt here. <laughs> but he was looking for the source of the Nile and finally died um, in, in northern Zambia uh, on his knees while he was praying, most likely from malaria itself. Um, his two greatest helpers um, opened up his heart or his body, took out his inner parts um, and buried them there. Uh, part of the argument was that his heart was in Africa and therefore um, they, they buried it under a tree. It's still a place that you can identify if you go there and then they carried his body all the way down to the east coast and on a ship took it back to England and that's how he was buried there. His journals and also his previous visits and just the, the heroic welcome that he received. Uh, he's, he's buried in what is called Westminster Abbey. And it's a place where no ordinary guys are buried. Okay, that's where the kings and the queens and the princes and those who uh, took a place in the history of England are buried. That's where his remains are buried. And it was uh, the effect of that that then brought so many other missionaries into the heart of Central Africa, which explains why I designated that as um, uh, David Livingstone and Central Africa, because he basically opened up that entire section. Yeah, my, my interpretation, first of all, is twofold. Uh, one is when you read his actual writings um, and the letters he was sending back home to his family and to his wife, he definitely loved her. So to be saying that he, he disdained his wife and just basically abandoned her with the children is, is reading a narrative into what isn't true. So that's, that's number one. The, the second is that if he was a, a missionary stationed in one place, he definitely would have loved his wife and children to be with him. It was the exploration bit that showed him that his children needed to be in a stable place and they should have at least one parent with them. And the mother was, was the best to be uh, placed there. And uh, I want to repeat again, the correspondence is not showing a woman who's abandoned. It is showing a woman who is still in a loving relationship with her husband, but recognizing that God gave us children, we need to give them a, a place where they can have a future. 
it's the equivalent today that happens with foreign missionaries, uh, like for instance, American missionaries when they come to Africa and then their children now have to go to college. Almost 100% of the missionaries I know send them back to America. And it's, anyone to say, hey, you hate your children. <laughs> Why are you sending them off to America? Well, it's because they are thinking these children need uh, this education, which is, is uh, better saved there than here. So it's, it's really the times in which he was living and the specific situation he was dealing with, that of opening up Central Africa. So I, I've, I've read uh, one or two of his biographies. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as well, and we can easily judge um, a previous era by our own situation, where we have the amenities here, we we have the, the transport, we have the you know the Zoom and internet and uh, FaceTime and you know everything else that can enable us to say okay. We'll leave our children there with an uncle or auntie, and then we will be communicating with them all the time. But they made the decision, let's raise our kids, and the wife need to be there. When their children had grown up sufficiently, as I said, the wife then came back to join him, and then died here. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. In fact, he actually wanted the Britons to come in. Uh, he wasn't thinking primarily that you rule the people. He was thinking in terms of the fact that the moment you establish yourselves here, the, the, the chiefs will not be able to sell their own people and the Arabs will not be able to get these people away because then the people are protected. In fact, often the phrase that was used in those days was not colony. The phrase that was used was protectorate. That's the phrase that was being used, protectorate, because it was primarily in terms of protecting. The, uh, I'll give you a typical example. In my country, a lot of the, the uh, when Zambia was under um, British, when it was a British protectorate, a number of the towns were named after British towns, okay? Uh, when Zambia became independent, there was only, all, the, all those towns were now given African names, all of them. There was only one town that up to now, Zambia's been independent now for, in two years' time, it will be 60 years. Up to now, there's only one town in the whole of Zambia that has a foreign name, and it's the name Livingstone. Okay, it's the only one. And it's because the Zambian people appreciate what Livingstone did for them. In fact, in 1973, which was 100 years after David Livingstone died, it was a public holiday in Zambia. And in major stadiums, Christians and Christian churches held services, thousands, tens of thousands of people gathered right across the country in order to commemorate the life and life and ministry of David Livingstone. So um, someone has to now come with a different narrative to try and make people think this was the enemy of the people because he brought in the colonialists. They appreciate the fact that he brought in the missionaries, and we are what we are today because he lived and he died and so on. Okay, even the naming of the Victoria Falls after the Queen, the main reason why we still in Zambia largely call it the Victoria Falls is because of David Livingstone, <laughs> out of respect for him. Otherwise, by now, that name would have been banished because, hey, 
you know, the Queen of England, what is that to do with us? Uh, but it's in honor of uh, uh, David Livingstone. Okay, 150 years after his birth, again, we had commemorative activities and David Livingstone's grandson was invited to Zambia at the expense of the Zambian government in order to come and lead these special uh, events. Yeah. So he did bring in the colonialists, but always remember, yes, they came with a gun in one hand and the Bible with the other, but it's a mixture. You inevitably had greedy guys. I mean, the Zambian name previously was Rhodesia. It was Northern Rhodesia and there was Southern Rhodesia. And the guy, Rhodes, who then used his name to, to name uh, all these places, was a, a, a young bachelor who, lived, who left England to come and make a fortune in Africa and initially began with South Africa and then made his way uh, across the Limpopo and uh, settled there, made a fortune for himself, and now there's the Rhodes Scholarships that are still being used in the world today, uh, and so forth. So there's a complete mixture, but it's wrong for us to then paint Livingstone as though he was also with that mercenary attitude. For him, you read his journals, it's really about the gospel. I'm glad I didn't rush. I almost rushed over into East Africa. Uh, but thank you for those questions. Anything else on Livingstone? I've, I've written a small biography of him. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a fascinating biography. So someone has read his entire biography a few times. Uh, you probably have your own heroes here, so I don't want to necessarily throw it on you. But definitely, he stands in the categories of William Carey and others um, for what they did. By the way, William Carey, it was basically the same thing. He carried his wife to India, kicking and screaming. Uh, she, yeah, we can say the same things about him. Why did he do it? He should have waited until he finally convinced his wife and so forth. Um, she ended up going mad primarily because she just could not stand what was going on, especially in her family when her own son died uh, young and she saw his death. She just could not stomach it. And that's how the nuts went loose. But that was missions work in those days. Um, in Zambia, as I, I was do, working on my PhD, I, it was on missions. And I went to look in the places where missionaries are buried. And you can cry when you see on their gravestones, so-and-so arrived maybe something like 1901 and then died 1902. I mean, grave after grave after grave like that. It just touches you that there was so much sacrifice that was undertaken to bring the gospel. And yet, as those people died, others came in the next boat after them, and so forth. My, my greatest missionary hero, by the way, is not David Livingstone. It's a lady by the name of Olive Carey Dock, D-O-K-E. I can talk about her until tonight. <laughs> Okay, uh, she came from England, got converted in Australia, New Zealand, then with her father, who was a pastor, and then came into Central Africa uh, at the age of 25, and labored there until she died in 1972. She came in 1916. She's probably still the longest serving Baptist missionary in that part of the world. And again, the sacrifice, the sacrifice that uh, they, they went through. Okay, thank you for those questions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think first of all, 
Christian work involves sacrifice. It's, it's like the work of a soldier. Um, any soldier who goes to the battlefield is, is, is endangering his life and is likely to turn his wife into a widow and his children into orphans. And yet they do it for temporal reasons. The, the missionaries, the preachers, the pastors do it for an eternal reason. So uh, we should avoid the extreme of thinking that uh, Christian service should not have those kinds of sacrifices. Um, I think where the balance is, is that it is, it's a sacrifice that you've largely agreed on with your spouse. Uh, because you, you want your spouse to do it also in their walk with the Lord. So you're working with the Lord and they're also working with the Lord and you're doing that together. Um, the difficulty is that it's not something you agree on with your children because you know, your children are young, they are born, uh, they don't even know anything about life. And then in due season, they can easily begin seeing their friends having benefits that you don't have. And it's not just missionaries, it's pastoral work as well. Uh, the, the, the children can see that their friends have wealth from their dads that your own children don't have, and they can easily take it wrongly. Um, but again, one hopes and prays that as they come to faith in Christ and they come to know him, they begin to see the privilege of sacrifice. Uh, and as Livingstone said, it's not really sacrifice in the light of what uh, God himself has, has done. Uh, so there is something to be said for, for that. Uh, as to the actual sacrifice somebody that undertakes and whether it is justified, uh, I, I want to repeat, it's, it's, it must be in the context of that person's work with the Lord. Um, and it's difficult for us to judge, first of all, because we are not in his shoes, but number two, right now we're, lo we're looking at people that lived two to three hundred years ago. It was a completely different context. Um, those of you who've read Adoniram Judson's biography, and if you've read the letter he wrote to his father-in-law-to-be, when he was now wanting the hand of that man's daughter for marriage, <laughs> I read it to our congregation once, and it, it blew them off their feet uh, that this man was writing such a letter to get the hand of a young lady from her father. Because it was basically saying, I'm taking her to die. And you never see her again. <laughs> okay. Um, and the father accepted that. In his own walk with the Lord, and in her walk with the Lord, and the man's walk with the Lord. And when you read the biography of Adonai and Judson, there's a point at which I always cry when I reach it. And it was the time he came out of prison and got back home and thought the wife was dead because she was asleep but was as thin as a skeleton under those blankets. And the, she had just given birth, so there was, the baby was being kept by somebody else, but within the same house. And as he wept, as he was looking at her and wept, the tears fell onto her face and she opened her eyes. And I tell you, every time I get that point, I choke. Uh, he ended up marrying three times. It was his third wife that survived him. Um, Going through that is sacrifice. 
But think of the sacrifice of God's own son. It makes all that pale into insignificance. So, yeah, there may have been some decisions that were unwise. Um, and sometimes God use, uses cracked pots so that the glory finally goes only to him and so forth. Uh, because we are fallen creatures, but we need a balanced view when we are considering what these people were doing. Yeah.